I recently received a request from a viewer in the comments section of one of my videos to compile a list of key books that you need to read to get a hang of the Whitechapel murders. And in this video, I am going to suggest 12 books that I feel should be on the shelves of all those who are interested in the case. With hundreds, if not thousands of books to choose from, whittling the list down to just 12 is no easy task. And some viewers might not agree with some of my choices, whilst others, no doubt, won't agree with any of them. Inevitably, a list such as this is a very personal one, and the books I am about to suggest are ones that I have found invaluable in my research and which I feel will help people gain an understanding of not just the murders, but also the background of the city, era and area where the crimes occurred. You might well have your own favourites which are not on the list, so please feel free to share them in the comments section below. Can I also say that the order in which the books are presented is in no way a reflection of which ones I consider the best. It's just that there has to be an order, and I simply put the books on the list in the order in which they came to me. So, without further ado, here is my list of 12 books that, in my opinion, are key to gaining a good understanding of the Whitechapel murders. My first recommendation is The Ultimate Jack the Ripper Sourcebook, an illustrated encyclopedia by Stuart P. Evans and Keith Skinner. The book brings together all the known official reports on the case that have survived, and Stuart and Keith have, to quote from the back and cover, used their joint knowledge and expertise to the painstaking collation of all the known official records to produce the ultimate Jack the Ripper book, a narrative account of the murders encompassing all the known evidence. Readers can peruse the entire contents of the Metropolitan Police's files covering the full series of Whitechapel murders. There are extensive press reports in here witness statements and extracts from police notebooks, documents that are missing from the official files, and many rare photographs. It does what it says on the cover and provides an invaluable reference. Unlike many books, it isn't structured as a narrative, but is instead a chronological record of the crimes and the police investigation into them. For those of us who need to check a fact or gain an insight into where the police were going with particular inquiries, the source book is invaluable as it saves us both the cost and the effort of having to make the journey out to Kew to view the official records at the National Archives. It is, therefore, a valuable resource and a must-have on the bookshelves of any student of the Jack the Ripper case. First published in 1975, Donald Rumbelow's The Complete Jack the Ripper was for many years the go-to book for those interested in learning about the case, and for many, it was the publication that started their journey into the world of Ripperology. It provides a good overview of the case, and begins with a chapter on Outcast London, which really does provide a terrific insight into the Victorian East End. There is an extensive section on Jack the Ripper suspects, as well as descriptions of several later cases, such as Jack the Stripper and the Yorkshire Ripper. Philip Sugden's The Complete History of Jack the Ripper was one of the first books to go into scholarly detail about the wider series of Whitechapel murders and to present the reader with detailed facts about the investigation into the crimes. He makes a determined effort to dispel many of the myths that have crept into Ripper law over the years and he points out mistakes and inaccuracies that those who have gone before him have made from police officers covering the case in their memoirs to modern-day authors, or at least authors up to the 1990s, who have perpetuated various fallacies about the case. One thing that most certainly stands out about the book is the respect he shows to the victims, and his delving into their lives so that we can view them as real people, and not just as almost minor characters in their murders. I have always liked the fact that Philip Sugden throughout tries to refer to the victims by their first names, as opposed to constantly referring to them by their surnames. The last four chapters of the book deal with specific suspects, and the reader is presented with a detailed analysis of the evidence for and against them. The author does have a favoured suspect, which I won't reveal, although he doesn't, like many authors who are trying to promote a particular suspect do, demand that the reader accept his findings without question, merely stating that his suspect is the least unlikely to have been Jack the Ripper. All in all, this is a scholarly assessment of the case, and the narrative flows well, and brings the history, the era, and the area, as well as the people connected with them, vividly to life.
Paul begs Jack the Ripper the facts, provides the reader with as extensive a coverage of the case as it is possible to get. Beginning with an in-depth background to the history behind the murders that introduces the readers to Victorian London as a whole, and the East End in particular, we get a vivid insight into the social conditions of the district in which the murders occurred, as well as into the uncomfortably wide chasm that existed between the wealthiest and the poorest citizens who lived their lives just a few miles apart. We also learn of the unrest that was beginning to surface amongst the downtrodden poor and unemployed that culminated in the events of Bloody Sunday in November 1887. Having taken the reader through several attacks and murders that preceded the onset of the Jack the Ripper crimes, Paul Begg then takes us through the events of the autumn of 1888, covering the murders, the suspects, the police officers who investigated the case, and the way in which the newspapers covered it. Paul goes into great detail about the lives of the victims and treats them with respect and in such a way as to leave the reader with a genuine understanding of the hardships they had faced and which ultimately left them vulnerable to the killer who we now know as Jack the Ripper. There is also extensive coverage of various Ripper suspects and the book concludes with a detailed and thorough list of notes and references so that the reader can, if desired, go back to the original sources to check facts and information. My next recommendation is The Five, The Untold Lives of the Women Killed by Jack the Ripper by Hallie Rubenhold. One of the many tragedies about murder victims is that they inevitably become overshadowed by their killer, especially in high-profile cases such as the Whitechapel murders, when the media coverage often strays into the realm of sensationalism and even fiction. I would hazard a guess that there are several cases of serial killers where people can effortlessly name the perpetrator, but are hard pushed to name his victims. With the five, Hallie Rubenhold endeavours to tip the balance of coverage from the killer to the victims, and provides the reader with a terrific insight into the lives of Polly, Annie, Elizabeth, Catherine and Mary Jane before and after they came to Whitechapel. The book provides a lot of information about social history of the time, and gives a vivid insight into the way in which women, and especially poor women, were treated by society in the second half of the 19th century. My next suggestion is The Complete Jack the Ripper A to Z by Paul Begg, Martin Fido and Keith Skinner. One of the problems with studying the Whitechapel murders, or for that matter, watching videos and documentaries about them, is the number of names you come across. You can be halfway through a chapter or watching a documentary when up pops a name of some minor and occasionally major player in the case and you find yourself either having to go to the index of the book or resorting to Google to find out who they were and what part they played in the story. The complete Jack the Ripper A to Z, or A to Z for my American viewers, solves this problem by providing entries for all the names you are likely to encounter in alphabetical order. Now, whenever an unfamiliar name appears, you can simply turn to the relevant entry and read a brief biography about the person in question, along with finding out about their connection to the case. In addition, the book also features listings for films, books, authors and researchers on the case, making it a comprehensive and invaluable resource for all students of the Jack the Ripper crimes. The next book on my list is... Capturing Jack the Ripper in the Boots of a Bobby in Victorian London by Neil Bell. In many ways, this is one of the most useful books to buy if you want to understand both the successes and the failures of the police investigation into the Jack the Ripper crimes. Neil Bell doesn't set out to present us with yet another suspect, and his book is all the better for that. What he does do is take the reader through what it was like to be a police officer in Victorian London, and of course at the time that the Whitechapel murders were taking place. Don't read this book expecting to be bombarded with wild speculation and endless theorising about why a particular suspect must have been Jack the Ripper. Mr Bell doesn't do wild speculation. What he does do is give the reader a thorough grounding in how the Metropolitan Police came into being what sort of crime prevention measures the average Bobby on the beat would have had at his disposal, and when crime prevention had failed and crime detection was called for, what the investigative techniques that were available to the likes of Inspectors Reed and Aberline were as they tried desperately to hunt down Jack the Ripper 
and stop him killing again. The result of this approach is that by the time you come to reading about the murders in part two of the book, you are truly au fait with how the police forces operated and are therefore able to comprehend not only the shortcomings of the detectives who worked on the case, but you are also able to approach the mystery with fresh eyes, having dispensed with many of the inaccuracies, distortions and misrepresentations that have come to plague modern-day reporting of the Ripper crimes. Next, we come to Jack the Ripper Suspects, persons cited by investigators and theorists by Stan Russo. Inevitably, the one thing that a large number of those who read about the case are interested in is knowing who the killer was, and there are hundreds of suspects to choose from. On the whole, I personally have never been interested in the endless race to name Jack the Ripper, and I tend to steer clear of books that are dedicated to proving that a particular person was the Whitechapel murderer, especially those that claim that it is now case closed or that they have finally solved the mystery. However, whenever I do need to check facts about a specific suspect, this is the book I turn to. Laid out in alphabetical order, it provides biographical details and presents the case for and against around 70 suspects whose names have, over the years, been put forward for the mantle of having been history's most infamous serial killer. We come now to the book Jack the Ripper on the London Press by L. Perry Curtis Jr. It could and often has been argued that the Jack the Ripper murders would not have achieved the notoriety they did had it not been for the huge amount of press coverage dedicated to them. Indeed, some have even argued with a certain amount of justification that Jack the Ripper was a fiction created by the Victorian media. In this book, L. Perry Curtis Jr. examines how a selection of London newspapers, dailies and weeklies, highbrow and lowbrow, presented the news about the Whitechapel murders and how, with their coverage, they reveal a great deal about the social and sexual norms of the era in which the crimes took place. This is very much an academic study, so it won't be everyone's cup of tea, but for those who stick with it, it provides a great insight into the role that the press played in creating and propagating the myth of Jack the Ripper. Moving away from books that deal explicitly with the Whitechapel murders, we come to William J. Fishman's East End, 1888. To gain a thorough understanding of the background against which the Jack the Ripper saga was played out, it is essential to delve into the everyday lives of the East Enders at the time, and this book provides a superb insight into the social conditions in the district where the murders occurred. Housing, health, sanitation, the sweating system, unemployment and the political aspects of the area are all covered in detail, whilst we are also able to glimpse the residents enjoying their leisure time. Again, this is very much an academic study that some readers might find a little dry, but for those who want to look beyond the sensationalism of the murders and view how the people lived at the time, this book is an absolute must. My only real criticism is that it lacks an index to aid quick access to information. My next suggestion is The Victorian City, Everyday Life in Dickens, London by Judith Flanders. Throughout the 19th century, Victorian London grew into a sprawling and vast metropolis that had by 1888 become the largest city in the world. Although the book is largely concerned with the decades when Charles Dickens was alive and writing, he died in 1870, it really does provide an idea of how London grew in the 19th century and the impact that that growth had on the people who lived there. To quote from the book's dust jacket, The Victorian city is a revelatory portrait of everyday life on the streets, bringing it alive the Victorian capital in all its variety, vibrancy and squalor. No one who reads it will view London in the same light again. The book covers everything from the horrific epidemics that hit the rich and poor alike, the varied and sometimes shocking night entertainments that both classes enjoyed, the different ways in which they travelled around their city, the foods that they enjoyed, and much more besides. My final recommendation is The People of the Abyss by Jack London. In the summer of 1902, the American author Jack London disguised himself in an outfit of old, dirty clothes 
and went undercover in the East End of London, where he experienced firsthand the grim reality of life for the inhabitants. The book makes compelling, if uncomfortable and at times stomach-churning reading, confronting us as it does with the sheer horror of what it was like to live in one of the poorest quarters of London as the Victorian age gave way to the Edwardian age. In one memorable chapter, he actually visits the home of Johnny Upright, none other than Sergeant William Thick, who 14 years earlier had loomed large in the arrest of John Pizer in the aftermath of the murder of Mary Nichols. I would suggest that if you do buy a copy, then ensure that you buy the illustrated version, as, in addition to the insightful text, you also get lots of contemporary photographs of London at the time, including the original of the well-known view of Dorset Street that has appeared in almost every book on Jack the Ripper. Although not directly about the Whitechapel murders, the book is a must-have for all students of the case as it really lifts the lid on the yawning gulf between the rich and the poor at the time. London's style of narration really will make your flesh creep and there can't be many books that leave you wanting to take a shower after reading each chapter. So that is my list of 12 books that I feel will help people get a hang of the Whitechapel murders. All the books can be found on Amazon, and several of them can be bought relatively inexpensively from sites such as ABE Books and eBay. Obviously, and as I mentioned earlier, a choice such as this is a very personal choice, so I would recommend that you go to Amazon and read the various reviews of the books before deciding which one suits your requirements. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and remember, if you have a favourite book that you think people should read, then please feel free to suggest it in the comments section below. Good reading.